But we constantly rush ourselves into believing our ideas are really hot and they're the right ones. And I think that it's a very, very dangerous thing, especially when our ignorance is so great. Yes, we, we've got very powerful tools for flipping genes back and forth and making products, but we don't have a clue what the implications of those manipulations will be in the long run. And the corporate drive to make profit now is hurrying us far too rapidly. Do you think science as a whole could benefit from an injection of the democratic process in where resources are uh, spent? In terms, of, in, in terms of, of direction, general direction? Well, I think the problem we've got today is there is already too much direction being dictated. Uh, right now, there's a huge thrust by the funding agencies that say, we want a cure for cancer, we want to solve this problem of global warming, or we want... And so, m money goes where there are, are current hot issues, and scientists go where the money is. Now, the problem is... Science doesn't move that way. Science doesn't go from experiment A to experiment B to experiment C to a cure for cancer. Now, but because the government is saying, here's money, we'll give you this money if you can show us that you're working towards a cure for cancer. So all of us scientists play this game. <coughs> we say, I'm interested in the rectal temperature of penguins. I'm making this up, of course. And there's suddenly money for global warming. So if I study the rectal temperature of um, penguins and show that it varies by blah, 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 then ultimately I can do this experiment, do this experiment, and I'm going to find a, a way to control global warming. Um, and that's the way that we get scientific funding. But that isn't the way science works. It's a myth. Science, the when you do experiment A, you have no idea what the results are going to be. If you knew what the results are going to be, you wouldn't do the experiment. So you do the experiment, the next thing you know, oh my God, I'm off doing experiments way over here in a different direction. That's the way science works. You go off and your, your experiments lead you along because you get answers you didn't expect. And then, you know, you're doing, you're doing your studies and you happen to go to a meeting or you're, you're in a bar and you meet another scientist working in a totally different area and you start talking about what you're doing and he tells you what he's doing and suddenly you go, hey, you know, with my results and what you're getting, you know, I bet you we could do, and you're, the, suddenly you're doing an experiment together and you're finding something that could lead to some important application. That's the way that science is done and is applied. We perpetuate a totally artificial notion that science proceeds in a linear fashion from A to B to C to D to a cure for cancer. And that's, I think that's a very dangerous way. And what we should be doing is supporting people in science because they're bright, they're really smart, and they ask good questions, period. And if they're really good, and you support good people in all kinds of areas, believe me, applications are going to come out. We can't predict what they'll be. But if you've got a lot of people doing a lot of good experiments, eventually there will be cures and solutions to this and that coming out of it. But I think it's a mistake to say, give the money only to those guys that are doing experiments on, on cancer research. Um, you know, I think back on a woman, a woman named Barbara McClintock, and way back in the 20s and 30s and 40s, she was doing studies in corn. And her experiments were absolutely exquisite. And I remember as a graduate student having to read her papers. They were really hard papers, but the, they were so elegant. We were made to read them. What she was studying was genes in corn that jumped from one place on the chromosome to another. They were jumping genes. And when they jumped from one place to another, they affected the, the, the behavior of the genes where they jumped to. I mean, this is bizarre. And she elegantly showed how you can control where those genes jump from, from cell to cell. And we always said, those are so wild. They're only found in corn. I mean, it's weird. We had to study them because they were elegant genetics. Nobody ever dreamt in the 50s and 60s when I was a student that her work would lead to the discovery of a whole series of jumping genes in fruit flies and human cells and other kind of cells, and that it would become a very powerful tool for the study of genes and development, and that she would win a Nobel Prize. But that's what happened. 
if way back in the 30s and 40s, she was told, you've got to do research that will be applied in the area of development, she would never have got a grant for what she was doing. And I can tell you, experiment after experiment, scientist after scientist, who was studying all kinds of weird things. I remember a guy named uh, Werner Arbor, who was studying uh, how bacteria could uh, keep bacterial viruses from infecting them. Now, that's you got to admit, that's a pretty obscure thing. The bacteria have their own viral diseases, and this guy was studying how bacteria are resistant to viral infection. Well, guess what? What he discovered was that those bacteria w were able to resist viral infections because they made an, a protein that chewed up the viral DNA. They were called restriction enzymes. They restricted the virus from infecting the bacteria. Well, guess what? Those restriction enzymes recognize very specific DNA sequences and are now one of the critical tools that has made genetic engineering possible. Nobody ever imagined that Werner Arbor, studying how bacteria resist virus infections, would lead to one of the important tools of biotechnology and that he would win a Nobel Prize. So, I'm sorry I've given you a very long answer, but I really think that you support top-notch scientists on the faith they're going to they're going to find something interesting. We have no idea where, but they're going to find something interesting and useful. So you gave up your work in the lab. Did you keep your teaching? I uh, No, I, I got the university. They wanted to keep me on the roster because they felt it added luster to their, to their uh, faculty.